joyful hearts. Together let us worship God. Let us seek this morning the way of God. This from Rumi. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, 
The world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. Amen. O oh God, origin of the universe, may this hour our soul hear the voice and wisdom of the Spirit speaking and giving gesture in every moment around us and within us through the words spoken and the music played and sung and the presence of one another gathered here in this chapel. May we have ears to hear and eyes to see and sensation to feel the Spirit all around and within. Amen.
this scripture, <clears throat> Matthew 13, 1 through 9. On that day, after Jesus went out of the house, he sat by the lake. And such a large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat to sit while the whole crowd stood on the shore. He told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and devoured them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. They sprang up quickly because the soil was not deep. But when the sun came up, they were scorched, and because they did not have sufficient root, they withered. Other seeds fell among the thorns. They grew up and choked them. But other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundred times as much, some sixty and some thirty. The one who has ears had better listen. Uh, let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for Lord, you are the rock of our lives and you are our Redeemer. Amen. To Christians, their attitudes and their behaviors ever make you cringe? It may not happen to you, but as one who lives in the world, in the faith world each and every day, I notice cringe worthy behavior with disheartening regularity. Case in point, the Reverend Creflo Dollar. He's a prosperity evangelist in Atlanta. Allegedly, that's his real name. Last year, Reverend Dollar had his church people praying for and paying for a new top-of-the-line Gulfstream G650 business jet, a $65 million ticket that he said they absolutely needed to spread the word. Now... The community church doesn't have any private aircraft. <laughs> of course, we do have that need, but certainly not for a G650. <laughs> Case in point number two, televangelists, you've all seen them. So enthusiastic about faith, right? I literally, watching my computer two weeks ago, saw a video of a televangelist promoting the power of his own prayer capabilities. And he pointed a finger at the camera and said, my prayers have made midgets grow. <laughs> Case, I know. Case in point number three. It's 2015, Robert Louis Deere goes into a Planned Parenthood clinic and opens fire. He kills three people. He wounds nine others, driving his actions, his Christian beliefs. He was one who was, quote, very religious, read the Bible often, and was always talking about Scripture. Final case in point, the Ku Klux Klan. Nothing more than domestic terrorists. How many lynchings? Have they been involved in and responsible for over the years? Their stated goals are, and I quote, to reestablish Protestant Christian values in America by any means possible, end quote, offering on their website that Jesus was the first Klansman. If all these people are part of the club called the Christian faith, sometimes I want to take my membership elsewhere. Unless you think that these are extreme cases, what about the Appalachian Christians who feel a need to handle poisonous snakes during their worship services as an act of faith? What about those 
who yearn for glossolalia, speaking in tongues during worship, as a way to show the Spirit is really in them. What about those explorers on Mount Ararat who spend millions trying to discover any sort of remnant of Noah's Ark to show that every square inch of the Bible is literally true? And what about those Christian bullies that probably every single one of us have encountered who could care less about what we think about faith or how we experience God, but they look us in the eye and they say, you know, you had better accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or else you'll rot in hell. All are examples of why I find myself these days increasingly less comfortable with the label Christian. A word that was created by very well-intentioned followers of Jesus about 10 years after he died. The label was believed to mean back then simply one who acted like Christ. But now some 2,000 years later, Christian has evolved in a direction that I'm really not sure what it means anymore. So these days, I for one pretty much leave the word Christian in the drawer. Simply choosing to describe myself as one who follows Jesus or simply as a child of God. But every once in a while, every once in a while, there's something that happens, that changes. Changes how I think about it and causes me to say, yes, now that's Christianity. That's the club I want to be part of. And it's typically the case, as I shared last week, when we have a profound spiritual kind of awakening or we we, we say, yes, there's Christianity, it's absolute best, it often begins with tragic circumstances. Such was the case with this story. The time was June of 2015. The place was the historic city of Charleston, South Carolina. Specifically, the Emmanuel... African Methodist Episcopal Church, where a dozen or so members had gathered for a midweek Bible study. The passage was the same as the one Zach just read for us, the parable of the sower that's found in Matthew and Mark and in Luke. It's a parable of Jesus where he foreshadows his own death, saying it's only when a grain of wheat dies and falls into the earth, into good ground, Does it bear much fruit? Well, midway through the Bible study, you're probably starting to recall this nightmarish story. Midway through the Bible study, in walks Dylan Roof, age 21, a young white man who is graciously welcomed at the table. For a time, he sits quietly, taking it all in from the prayers to the give and take on this well-known parable. Then Roof stands. He spews a horrifically racist, hate-filled speech. And then he reaches for his 45 caliber Glock, a weapon that he had purchased with money he received on his 21st birthday. Roof stood and he pulled the trigger continually until the Glock was spent. And Cynthia? And Susie, and Ethel, and Depain, and Clementa, and Taiwanza, and Daniel, and Sharona, and Myra, all lay dying. Nine people ranging in age from 26 to 87 who'd simply gone to church that night for a Bible study, lie dying in that house of worship. Then, over the next few days, as if sociologically and spiritually applying Newton's third law to Roof's venomous act, you know, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, to Roof's unbelievable act, There comes this equally unbelievable response. A series of acts of love and mercy and forgiveness 
the likes of which I don't remember in my lifetime, for just one day, after Ruth killed those nine people, relatives of the victims faced him in court in a preliminary hearing. And almost to a fault, they offered words of forgiveness and mercy. Nadine Collier was one. She stood up publicly and before Ruth, probably a dozen feet away, said, you took something very precious from me, but I forgive you. You hurt me. You hurt a lot of people, but may God forgive you. Then, just three days after that, four days after eight fellow congregants and their senior pastor were slain, the people of the Emmanuel AME Church held a spirit-filled worship service in the bloodstained church that had only been released by the FBI four hours earlier as a crime scene. And they stood, and you can picture it, you can hear it in your mind, that full congregation singing of Christ, you are the source of our strength. You are the strength of our lives. All while across Charleston at noon that day, every single church rang bells for nine minutes in solidarity with the Emmanuel AME Church and the victims lost. Then that Sunday evening, some of you have been there, there was a chain of people, their hands black and white and yellow and brown, people of every color and flavor, holding hands across the Arthur Ravenel Jr. Bridge. It goes from Charleston all the way to Mount Pleasant, holding hands in solidarity and in sisterhood and brotherhood. The night that Dylan shot those nine people, he said to them that he was going to incite a race war Instead, what he did is he unleashed Christians and Christianity at its absolute best. Yet how did the world respond to the grace and mercy and forgiveness that was shown Dylan Roof? Maybe because we're all so conditioned to hearing these crazy stories about Christianity like Creflo Dollar's new G650 jet or televangelists who claim to make little people grow or those who kill while claiming to follow the Prince of Peace. We're so conditioned to hearing stories about the Christian faith that make us cringe that the Emmanuel AME's church's response was so contrary to the actions in our culture where if something happens to us, what do we do? We react. Action, reaction. And they did just the opposite. They responded with love and mercy and forgiveness. And you know what? The world didn't get it. Author Jill Caratini writes, people were suspicious. They didn't understand how anybody could be so loving and filled with grace. Editorials throughout the United States expressed concern. Some writers were filled with anger that any sort of forgiveness should be shown roof. One commentator went so far as to attribute the forgiveness of the African-American Christians at that Emmanuel AME church as being little more, and I quote, mere symptoms of the history of black intimidation. Theirs was simply a hope to survive in a white world." End quote. Christianity, it's a faith of extremes. From Alpha to Omega, people on one hand whose behaviors make us cringe. Yet so extreme, on the other hand, so grace-filled and loving that a baffled world is left with their collective heads shaking, not able to believe 
what they've heard and seen. When thinking about the Christian faith, I'm reminded of what Winston Churchill said of democracy. Maybe the Christian faith is similar. Churchill wrote, democracy is the worst form of government except for all those other forms that have been tried. Christianity, you can decide if you want to use the word or the label. You can decide if it's right for you. And as you consider whether it's a fit or not, know that as long as human beings are involved in the Christian faith, it's going to fall short. But for those of us who do choose to follow that path, as our sisters and brothers at the Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston have shown, it provides a means for you and for me to align ourselves with love, not hate, mercy, not judgment, and hope, hope, not despair. Amen. Grab that last bag there and turn.
start out with this beautiful, beautiful voice. So crystal clear, inspiring. And then in that same song, on the other extreme is all this wacky percussion all over the place. That's the Christian faith. Extremes from Alpha to Omega. What you and I need to remember, though, is not Christianity religion, not Christianity organization, but instead the way of Christ, which for you and for me is about love and not hate, mercy and not judgment, peace, not war, and hope, not despair. Go in peace, and the people said, Amen. Amen.